family. My name is Pastor Derek Parks, and I am so excited to worship with you guys today. Man, what a wonderful time in worship that was. Listen, we are in a brand new series called Proclaim, and we are walking through seven sermons in the book of Acts that are going to help us get a glimpse into the early church and how the life of the church transformed and formed through the proclamation of the early church. And so I'm excited today to bring you this word. Uh, listen, I, 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 I've, I've been steeped into this word and studying it, and, and, and I'm so excited to bring this word to you today. And as we are jumping into this passage, I, I want to help us today to see uh, how God desires for us, his people, to proclaim the name. And so I'm going to tag this text just that as proclaim the name. We'll be in Acts chapter 4 today. And so in Acts chapter 4, I'll be just in, in one verse I'll read, but uh, I'm going to walk us through some context to help us understand where we are in the passage. And so let me do a quick little commercial break before I jump into that and welcome you. If this is your first time uh, joining us, we're so excited that you're here. We're so grateful to the Lord that you joined us today. We want to shout you out and welcome you. Epiphany, show some love to anybody who's watching for the first time in the comment section. And so listen, uh, we're grateful that you're here in the description. You can check out all the different ways that you can get connected to us and to be a part of our church here at Epiphany Church in Wilmington. And so uh, also I want to announce quickly that this Saturday coming up, we're going to have our food giveaway. Y'all know how we do every uh, third Saturday of the month. We're giving away food to folks in our community and serving our community in a big way. And so we're excited about that on this Saturday coming up. And so listen, let's, let's jump back into this word. Uh, I'm excited to preach to you today and to bring the word of God from Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I'm going to read it for your hearing. It says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Father, I pray by your spirit, God, that you would lead us today in this proclamation. God, help us to proclaim the name. God, I pray, God, that as I stand here, God, that you would speak through my mind, God, speak through my body, speak through my mouth, God. I pray, God, that you would teach your people through your servant today. God, help me to be uh, just a vessel for your glory. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So th there was a missionary by the name of E.P. Scott, and he was ministering in India where he felt called to go into the less known part of India. Now, answering this call, he went forth and, and after two days of travel, he found himself suddenly surrounded by an armed band with spears pointed at him and at a loss for what to do. Missionary E.P. Scott, he pulled out his violin and began to play and sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Now listen, he was understandably afraid, and he continued to sing with his eyes closed. <laughs> Homie had his eyes shut because he was afraid. And in that, but in that fear, he, he, he kept his eyes closed, and he continued to sing, all the way through the third verse. And then finally, he opened his eyes and was astonished to see spears on the ground and the men who were surrounding him were now in tears. On that day in India, it was again rediscovered that there is power in the name of Jesus. And it is at this point in uh, uh, in the proclamation of Peter that I, uh, I, I, I want to help us because this, this story that I just told, it fits right within this passage. It teaches us that there is power 
in the name of Jesus. I want to give us some context here to, to help, help us understand this text. The church had at this point is, had continued to grow. Remember, after Peter's first sermon in Acts chapter 2, it said that the Lord added to the number of the church 3,000 people. And so at the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus, committed themselves to walking in a kingdom relationship with Jesus and and to obeying his commands and following after his life. 3,000 people. And the church continued to grow. And some of the original disciples began to demonstrate the power of God uh, through performing signs and wonders. So in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they healed a man who had been unable to walk. There was this man at the gate called Beautiful, and he would be at the gate called Beautiful. His friends would take him there so that he could ask for alms from the people as they were entering into the temple. But as they were there, as he was asking for alms, uh, people knew that he was unable to walk, and their perception of him was that he was a beggar. And, and, and that's the reality here. I, I want to help us to see. I want to help us to shape our ideals, to shape our, our, our reality around this notion here is that even though you might be in a precarious situation, I want you to know that there is a God who cares about your circumstance. Even though you might be unable to navigate <laughs> throughout life on your own, there is a God who is concerned about your circumstance. But listen to this. Peter and John, they were walking up to this gate and the man was sitting there and he's asking for alms from people. And so they asked, he asked Peter and John and Peter turns to the man and he says, listen, friend, silver and gold, I have none, but what I have, I will give unto you. Stand up and walk. And so this man who had been lame, he now gets up and he's walking around with Peter and John and he's so excited. He's so happy. He's so elated that now he can walk that he's jumping all over Peter. He's jumping over John and and he's walking through the city and he's walking through the gate. And so much so his joy was expressed so much so that people started to notice him. His healing led to his proclamation that something had changed in his life. The the healing that took place in his life led to a proclamation where he's like, listen, I don't know what took place, but all I know now is that I'm able to walk and I'm able to move around where I was not before. And listen, when you get healed from your sin sickness, you ought to make a proclamation to the Savior. When, when, when you are healed, when, when God does something in your life, when God transforms your life, when God heals you, it ought to cause you to proclaim something about the goodness of Jesus. Now, here's what happened. Here's what happened. The next day, <laughs> the, the, as he was going around, some of the high priests in the Sanhedrin, they heard about what happened and they started hating. <laughs> We know what goes on. They, they started hate and they started saying, wait a minute, we got rid of that Jesus. Now, 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 some of his disciples are doing some of the same stuff that he did while he was here. Hold on. Let, let's find out what's going on. So, so the next day they, arre- they, had a, they had arrested Peter and John and they started to question them. And the, the, the Sanhedrin, they, they were the rulers of the temple. They were the, the, the ones who, who, who were part of the ruling and governing body of the Jews at that time. And, and, and there were some high, there was a formal high priest and, 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 and he was able to rule in, 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 in the stead of the Roman occupation because he had come from a high family and all that different kind of stuff. But, but nevertheless, the, these powerful men were now interrogating Peter and John about what they had done as it it related to this man who was lame, but now is able to walk. And so here's what what we see. This is is beautiful for us to see that because in, in, in chapter four, we see this conversation. And so the Sanhedrin, they they summoned Peter and John and they asked them a very important question. Here's the question that they asked them. They asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this thing? (laughs) They asked them, by what power or by what name have you healed 
this man. The question is a setup for a proclamation. See, when, 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 when something happens in your life, when you go through difficulty and trial, when you go through things and God works it out, when, when, when things happen in your life and God moves in your life, that's just a setup for a proclamation. And I don't know about you, but God has set me up for some proclamations. God has done some things in my life where I couldn't help but tell about the goodness of God in my life. There are some things that God has done in my life, and it was a setup just for me to be able to proclaim his goodness and his power to those who were around me. But here's what happened with Peter. Peter didn't answer the question. <laughs> Peter didn't answer the question immediately. Instead, he, he, he first turns their position upside down by painting them as being opposed to a good deed done to a crippled man. He, he says, listen, y'all bother. If you, you're talking about, well, about a good deed that we've done for somebody who was in trouble. Like you, you're talking about us doing something good for somebody who was struggling. Is that what you mean? Like, is, is that what you're talking about? Peter was slick, a slick talker. He couldn't help it. His mouth was a little crazy. He was cutting people's ears off and stuff. We know Peter, but, but he, he got into this situation and he's like, listen, <laughs> I want to help you to know uh, that, that if you're talking about the good deed that was done, that miracle that happened, that happened by the power of the name of Jesus. So in essence, here's how the conversation went. I want to summarize it for you a little bit. I'm going to summarize it for you, Wilmington style. It was the, the, the Sanhedrin was like, yo, homie, like what, what happened? Like what, what's going on here? We, the, we're hearing that this man who, 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 who was not able to walk, he's now able to get up and walk around. What happened? What went down? And so Peter is like, listen, if you mean <laughs> that, that performing a good deed for someone who was sick, well, I want to help you know this. I want to help you understand it was done by the power of Jesus. It was done by the power of the name of Jesus. And if you are confused, I want to help you. He's going to let them know. He's saying, this Jesus whom you crucified, this Jesus who you gave up uh, in place of sinners, this Jesus who when you had the opportunity to turn him loose, you sent in a barbarian who was going around killing people and delivered him over to freedom instead of freeing the Jesus who all he did was heal the sick, heal blind eyes and feed people. That's all he ever did. But you crucified him and you turned him over to be killed. And listen, at this moment, I want you to catch the scene. You could probably hear a pin drop in the room. They were in what was known as, as Solomon's uh, portico. They were in the place and, 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 and they were having this conversation. And, and when he says this to them, when he checks them, because that's what he did, he G checked them. He let them know, listen, you're up here talking crazy, but I want to help you. But Peter don't stop there. He goes on and he wrecks up their whole philosophy about who Jesus is. He tells them this. He says, listen, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is a remarkable claim to make to a group of religious experts. Everyone there in that day would have known the scripture very clearly. Here's what they would have known. Only God can save. The religious experts who were surrounding Peter, the, the ones who he now had an audience with, they would have known that only God can save. So here is Peter standing before these religious experts, standing before the Sanhedrin and the high priests, and he's letting them know that there is no other name given under heaven whereby salvation comes from, but through the name of Jesus. 
And so look, he, he, he's challenging their perspective about who Jesus was. He's letting them know, listen, you crucified him and you killed him, but you didn't know that he was the one who brought salvation. He's letting them know that you crucified him and you killed him and you sent him up before the Romans and you made him a public spectacle, but you didn't know that he was the one who was bringing salvation for your life because Isaiah 43 and 11 tells us, is, here's what it says. It says, I, I am the Lord besides me, there is no savior. The, 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 the prophet Isaiah, he writes this prophetic notion and he's showing us here that salvation only comes from God. And so what Peter is doing, he's pointing them to this reality. And I love when people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God and none of that other stuff. That's not true. You haven't read your Bible if you don't see that. And neither did his disciples who were a part of walking with him and living with him. They didn't believe that either. They knew that Jesus was in fact God so much so that he tells them in the this passage that there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. He's quoting Isaiah 43 to them. He's saying, listen, he's letting them know that the Lord besides him, there is no savior. And Peter is saying that salvation is found in the name of Jesus and Jesus alone. And it is this proclamation that Peter focuses on the power of God in Christ and we begin to see a move of God happening. And so listen, I wanna help us today. He's, he's showing us, he's saying, listen, Peter is saying to us, he says, there is salvation in no one else. <laughs> there is, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. See this salvation, it talks about deliverance preservation, safety, and salvation. See, I already told you, P Peter's big swagging <laughs> in his encounter with the religious rulers who, who maintained their power in the Roman Empire because of, of who their families were. But Peter demonstrates the truth of his claim by his very presence in front of the Sanhedrin. See, the, the Sanhedrin, they were astonished by this proclamation because they realized, verse 13 tells us, they realized that John and Peter were uneducated and common men. And because they were uneducated and common men, they would not normally have had an audience with the Sanhedrin. But the only reason why they have an audience with the Sanhedrin is because of the name of Jesus that they walked and proclaimed. It was only because of the name of Jesus that they were able to have an audience with these people. And so Jesus is, we're, we're finding out in this passage here that the name of Jesus is powerful enough to put you in places where you should not be because of your pedigree. The, the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus is powerful enough to put you in spaces and places where you didn't deserve to be because of where you came from. See, the power of Jesus is strong enough to elevate you to places and spaces where you get to be a beacon of light and a vessel to proclaim his name simply because of the power of his name. I, I, I want to see that. I want you to see this. They, they, Peter points to Jesus in his audience with the Sanhedrin. He makes the proclamation that Jesus is the reason why I'm here because it's his name, his name that has been, that is above every name because there's salvation in no one else, but in him. And in their ordinary, in their ordinariness, uh, they, they proclaim the extraordinary God. In their ordinary state, they proclaim that God is extraordinary and he does wonderful things, including making a man who's, who has been lame get up and walk around and leap around the city. The word salvation here comes from a, a, a word, soter which was a common Greek epithet for the gods. And so Peter's really swagging here. Like, I need you to see this. Like, Peter is, is really showing them something. He's saying, listen, salvation is 
is, in, is found in no one else. Salvation comes through no one else. And I know that this word here, this Greek word is used to talk about the Greek gods and it's used to talk about the personalities in world affairs like Epicurus and Ptolemy. And, and they use that word to talk about Zeus and Apollo and Hermes. But Peter is letting them know, nah, salvation belongs to Jesus. Salvation belongs to this one. It belongs to this name. Those names, those names are popular for you, but there is a name that is above all those other names. There is a name that salvation comes through, and it's Jesus. Scripture describes for us four, a fourfold salvation. I want to help us to see this really quickly. We are saved from the penalty, the presence, the power, and the pleasure of sin. See, when we, when we are saved, we are rescued from the penalty of sin. The scripture tells us that the penalty for sin is death. The wages of, gift, of, of death uh, of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It, 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 when we get saved, when we receive salvation, we are saved from the penalty of sin, meaning that when we die in Christ, we aren't dead and don't go on to eternal perishing, but we go on to eternal life in Jesus. And it's letting us know that the penalty of sin is no more because of what Jesus has done. We no longer have to deal with the power of sin over our lives because we have been saved from the power of sin in our life. We sing the song, the power of sin is broken. Jesus has won it all. Sin has no more power over you. You're no longer a slave to sin anymore. You're now slaves to Christ because of his salvation in your life. Listen, you are free. You are saved from the presence of sin in your life. Sin doesn't have to linger around you any longer because of what Jesus has done in your life. The stuff that you used to struggle with and couldn't shake anymore, you are now free from that because of what salvation provides to you. The last piece is this. We are saved from the pleasure of sin. Listen, look, let's be real. We used to enjoy the stuff that we did. We used to enjoy the sin that we walked in. We, 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 we used to love it. We used to love all of the stuff that we did. We used to love our body count. We used to love all the people that we've been. We used to love that stuff. But now, because of, because of what Jesus has done, now because of the salvation that Jesus only brings, we don't even have to have the pleasure of sin in our life anymore because Jesus frees us from even the pleasure of sin. The stuff that we used to love, we now detest it. The stuff that we used to like, we don't like no more. The things that we used to love to do, we don't love to do those things anymore because we are saved from those things. Now, here's what I want to help, because I, I, I did that to point us to this. When he talks about salvation belonging to no one else, this idea is talking about the future salvation that we have. This future salvation is the sum of the benefits and blessings which the Christians who have been redeemed from all earthly ills and wills enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummated and eternal kingdom of God. Listen, family, all the stuff of this world that holds us bound, all the stuff of this world that oppresses us, all of the things of this world that challenge us, those things will be no more. We have a future salvation because Jesus is returning. And when he comes back, we will be redeemed from all of those things when he consummates his kingdom in his return. You've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. You've been redeemed by Jesus. And it has a very present reality in your life. Those are the, that's that fourfold salvation that I talked about from the penalty, the power, the presence, and the pleasure of sin. But there is a future reality where we have no more suffering or sorrow anymore. Revelations tells us that there will be no more death and no more dying because when Jesus comes back and he cracks the sky and he comes back for his people, guess what? None of that stuff will matter anymore. Racism won't be an issue 
anymore. Systemic injustice won't be an issue anymore. Misogyny won't be an issue anymore. Rape culture, all this other stuff, it won't be an issue anymore because Jesus will come to save his people. And he tells us here that salvation is in no one else. And then he says, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. The name. <laughs> See, we, 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 I, I want to help us. The, the name here, when it talks about the name, it, it's a word that talks about the character of Jesus. It's a word that's used to talk about the authority of Jesus. And so when we see this idea here is that there is no other name, we're talking about the fact that Jesus is the only one who was able to do what he did. <laughs> Jesus is the only one who had the perfect character in order to satisfy the wrath of God over our lives. Jesus is the only one who had the authority to do away with sin. That's why he got into trouble so much with, <laughs> with the religious rulers, because he would tell people, he says, go and sin no more. He says, go, your sin has been forgiven you. And they were looking at him crazy like, who is this who thinks that he can forgive sin? Sin. Only God can forgive sin. And he let them know, listen, yeah, you're right. Only God can do that. You're looking at him and that's me. And I want us to see this is because when it talks about the name, when we see the name, we see in the scripture that there is no other name whereby men must be saved. But Jesus has been given a name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, at the character and authority of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, listen to me, every Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on the earth, under the earth and above the earth that Jesus is in fact Lord. I want to help us today. This, uh, this word here for name, it talks about the cause or reason. See, Jesus, the name of Jesus is the cause and the course and the reason for the transformation of our lives. See, what we do here is that we want to help everyone have an epiphany that allows the grace of God to appear to them. And here's how we do that. We do that through the proclamation of the name of Jesus. And I want to help us because he tells us that there's no name under heaven through which men might be saved. There's no other name under heaven. He's, he's letting us know that underneath the heavens, in this realm, in this space, there is no other name given whereby people might receive salvation. And so this idea here of under heaven, it talks to us about this, is that no matter what the forces are around you that are attempting to provide you with a source of salvation, no matter what the things around you that are trying to convince you that salvation is in them. See, when, when you were in the world, listen, when you were going around and, and, and there were certain things that you thought were your salvation. See, there were certain people who you thought were your salvation. That there were certain ideals and philosophies that you adhered to that you thought were your salvation. And listen, it's still the same today. Even after you have been in Christ, there are still things that are fighting in your life to prove that they are your salvation instead of Jesus. They are trying to prove that they can save you versus Jesus being able to save you. That's why you find yourself getting caught up in relationships that you have no business being into is because you think that those things will bring you salvation. God, if you just give me a husband, I'll be all right because you believe that your salvation can be found in you being married to somebody. But the reality is, I want to help us today, is that God is showing us that that stuff doesn't save you. Those things don't save you. Listen, some of you believe that that weed that you smoke is your salvation. 
Some of you believe that the parties that you attend, that, that those things are your salvation. Some of you believe that your identity is your salvation. I'm an American. All of those different things. Do you think that that stuff is your salvation when in fact there is no other name under heaven whereby men are saved? It's only through Jesus. He's talking about the heavens, the, the universe, the world, the, the, the expanse of the sky. He's saying, listen, there's nothing under heaven whereby people must be saved. And I want to help us to understand this. I want to help us to see this and know that because as he's telling us, he's pointing us to this reality here and helping us to see. He's saying, listen, there is no other name under heaven that has been given whereby people must be saved. This word here, given, is one of my favorite Greek words because it's a word that talks about, about supplying you or furnishing you with the things that you need. But more than that, it talks about bestowing a gift onto you. And so what I need us to see in this passage, verse 12 here, he says, there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. See, the name that has been given to us is a gift. The name that has been given to us is a gift. And see, we, we take it too lightly when we call ourselves Christians. We, we, we take it too lightly when we call ourselves Christians because when we bear the name of Jesus, we ought to bear his life in our body. When we bear the name of Jesus, we have to understand that that is a gift that has been given to us. And in that gift, Jesus has supplied us and he has given us everything that we need for our advantage in this life. I want to help us to see this. Because God is doing something in us. Listen, this is, this is deep. He's telling us. He's saying, listen, I've given you my name so that you might have access to everything that is mine. Same thing is true for when I married my wife. It was important for me that she took my last name because in that, that meant that she had access to every part of me. Now, I hear y'all, y'all all modern and stuff like that. Like maybe we take different names or whatever. That's your business. Do what you want. But as for me, <laughs> she had to take my name because I, I, I wanted to, to, to walk in this ideal is that when we take someone's name, we carry access to everything that belongs to them. And listen, we take it too lightly when we proclaim the name of Jesus and don't walk in the access that he has given to us in order to proclaim the goodness of his name. We walk too much in fear. We walk too much in doubt. We walk too much concern and too much concern about our circumstances instead of being focused on the Savior. Now, I, I want to help us to see this. He's telling them, he's saying, listen, I've given you a gift by giving you this name. I've given you a gift by giving you a name that you can call on when you are hurting. I've, I've given you a gift by giving you a name that you can cry out to when you are suffering and in pain. I've given you a gift by giving you a name that you can call on. Listen, see, we got to get to this understanding because we've forgotten how to call on the name of Jesus when we're in trouble. We've forgotten how to call on the name of Jesus when we are in need. And more than that, we've forgotten how to call on the name of Jesus simply to have the presence of Jesus in our lives and family. We've got to understand that because salvation is in no other name but Jesus. And here's this beautiful reality here. This, this word here, oftentimes when you hear it, you hear it as that there's no other name given unto heaven whereby men must be saved. That men is translated as a generic for humanity. It is in, in, in the version that we read, the CSB, it, says, it calls it people. But it's the, it's the Greek word anthropos. It's a word that generally refers to human beings, both male and female. 
but it's a word that's used without reference to sex, nationality, or ethnicity. And so what I want to help us to see is this, is that the gift that has been given, the gift that has been given to us of the name of Jesus was given to people regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, their nationality, their creed, their gender, regardless of who they are, salvation comes through Jesus if they would just place their faith and trust in that name. And it is through him that we must be saved. It is through that name that we must be saved. This idea here, it talks about the necessity for us to be saved. It, it talks about the, the right and power, the need for us to be saved. And that necessity is brought on by the circumstances or by the conduct of those who are in need. It's, 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 it's also in reference to what is required in order to obtain a certain end. And so what we see here in this passage is he's letting us know. He's saying, listen, if you have a necessity for salvation, then it is in the name of Jesus. If you have a necessity to be saved, if you have a desire to be saved, if you have a need to be saved, it is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And it is in Jesus that we are saved. That word saved there, it talks about being kept safe and sound. But more than that, it talks about rescuing us from destruction. It is in Jesus that we have been saved from destruction. It's in Jesus that we are saved from danger. It is in him that our lives were snatched up from the course that we were on. We were heading on a course straight to eternal perishing. But the reality is this, is that Jesus stepped in 2,000 years ago and he came and he died for the sins of all and he came to save those who were lost. He saves and rescues us from destruction. Maybe you're listening to this and you don't know about that Jesus. I want to invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the risen one whose name is above every name. So much so that Peter stood before the Sanhedrin and let them know, I know that you know that salvation belongs to the Lord. I know that you know that beside him there is no other savior, but I need you to know this. That savior is Jesus. And the scripture lets us know in John 3, 16, it says that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son and whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Family, eternal life can be yours if you just place your faith and trust in Jesus. That's all you have to do. The scripture tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, then we can be saved. All you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is believe in him. Place your faith in Jesus and he can save you. He will save you. In fact, the scripture tells us that he is mighty to save. All you have to do is place your faith and trust in Jesus. Maybe you're listening and, and, you, and you, 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 you know Jesus, but you've strayed from him. You've walked away from him. I want to encourage you back into a relationship with Jesus. This is a call to discipleship. Tighten up, bring it in tight with Jesus, walk with him, find yourself connected in community where you can grow and learn with other believers and love Jesus more deeply and love the word. That's what we do here. We love the word. We live woven lead lifestyles of worship and leverage our work. And we want to invite you into that. Trust in Jesus today. He's able to save you. Trust him. Maybe you, you, you're looking for a church. We'd love to have you here at Epiphany. You can check out the link in the, des in the description and find out how to become a member. We have a, a growth track the first Sunday of every month where you can come and participate in that and join our church. And we're, we're, we're so thankful for that name today. We're so thankful for the name of Jesus that saves us, that saves us from the penalty, the power, the pleasure, and the presence of sin in our lives. 
that we want to proclaim that to everybody. And so family, as we're walking through this, I, I want to help us to proclaim the name because it's the name of Jesus that brings salvation. I want to pray for us. Father, I pray by your spirit, by your grace, that you would continue to lead us and guide us into truth. Help us, Father, to see you and to see you lifted up and risen. And Father, I pray that we would proclaim the name, the name that is above every name, the name that has been given as a gift to us. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things with thanksgiving, knowing that you can do everything that you said you would. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We're so grateful to you guys for joining us. We're so happy that you were here. Listen, if you're watching this at a later time, we're so thankful that you're watching. Uh, we thank you for everybody who, who, who gives here, who's a part of serving here and, and, and loving here and, and who is a part of our church, every member. We're so thankful to you. Uh, if you're a giver, we, we're so grateful for that. Um, you know how to give. If you're not, we want to invite you to become a giver uh, because the, of the simple fact that you can't outgive God. Uh, and when you give to God, he, he, he'll give back to you uh, with a measure that's pressed down, shaken together, running over. And so I want you to jump into the jet stream of what God is doing through our church here, through giving, and you can give to God. We'll have the, uh, the ways that you can give right up after this. Um, but we're so thankful for everybody who does give and who participates in the life of our church. And so family, we love you. We're grateful to the Lord for you. And we'll see you guys on Wednesday night for Midweek Epiphany. Grace and peace. Thank you so much for joining us for our online worship gathering. If you made a decision to walk with Jesus today, we want to know about it. So text, I decided to 302-310-4480 and someone will follow up with you immediately. If you made a decision to walk with Jesus, you have made the greatest decision of your life. Now I know this is a very trying time for many of us. So if you would like prayer, please text the word prayer to 302-310-4480 and one of our prayer wonder team members will follow up with you immediately to pray. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that you have a great week. Be blessed. Thank you.